Welcome to your next mission video podcast. What a great show we have for you today. We have a very special guest, the 17th Sergeant Major of the Army, SML Michael R. Weimer. We're going to talk about call of service and what that means to you and how it's so important and so much more. You won't want to miss this one, so don't you go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome to your next mission video podcast where we tell the stories of those who have served in the past and those who are serving today. From transition to financial wellness, VA benefits to mental health, we cover issues facing veterans, active military, and their families. Now here's your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army and co-founder of the American Freedom Foundation, Jack L. Tilly. Hello out there, warriors, past and present, and your families, and thank you for your service to our great country. Now, before we get started, I personally want to thank our presented sponsors, Blue Cross Blue Shield, FEP Dental and FEP Vision, Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue Global, and USAA for making your next mission happen. They love our veterans and families. As I say it every week, we love them too. As I said earlier, we're going to be talking about call to service and also the oath of enlistment and how both shape lives of our future soldiers. And I'm so excited to introduce the 17th, I was the 12th, so the 17th Sergeant Major of the Army, SMA Michael R. Weimer. Welcome to the show. Hey, SMA Tilly, it's great to be here today. Uh, I've been excited about doing this. We've been talking about it for a while, and uh, it's hard to make schedules work, but we're here. <laughs> That's I'm, I'm applauding right that. Hey, before we get into too much, would you tell the audience just a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, try to give you some stuff that maybe is not in the bio. Uh, I, I'm an I'm an army brat. Uh, my dad was a quartermaster officer, and I spent a lot of time uh, overseas. Uh, my brother and I had a really awesome upbringing as army brats, and uh, all that time, about nine years, literally living in Germany three different times. My mom's uh, an army brat and uh, really the champion of our family, which most service service families know that uh, moms are pretty pretty important. Um, but uh, you know, I'm in I'm in my fifties and I still get excited about putting the uniform on. Uh, and I think you know that better than most uh, to get up and serve our uh, our soldiers and their families. Uh, it's still, I still get excited when the alarm goes off. And uh, same goes for my spouse. She's uh, she's pretty excited to serve the uh, the family members. We got two awesome daughters who are, uh, you know, out of the house and uh, starting their own journeys. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's a little bit, a little bit about me. I'm sure I'll weave some more in there as we go. No, oh, I appreciate it. You know, when your kids start moving out of the house, it, it makes it sort of lonesome in that house. That I mean, nobody's around. You, th you know, you start looking for them so a little bit there. Hey, hey, what is, uh, what is called a service and why is it so important? Yeah, so the call to service, and we're very intentional with that term, right? Now, obviously, I'm a little, I'm a little biased to the army, right? You know, um, army brat, uh, thirty years in the army myself. Uh, but really, what I'm passionate about when you really break that down, peel that onion back, is a call to service, that, and that service is a call to something bigger than yourself. Uh, and I think we take that for granted uh, all these years in uh, in uniform. We know what that is. We live it. We feel it. Our families understand what it means to to serve something bigger to your, bigger than yourself. The sacrifice associated with that, the pride that comes with that. Um, and, I, and I and I think we can no longer assume that all of America knows what that means. Um, uniforms one way, government service is another way. Being an EMT. Being a fireman, being a policeman, um, I mean, heck, the list is long uh, about, you know, when it comes to serving other people. Um, we just happen to be a little fond of the Army. Yeah, no, I got you. I, you know, I was going to ask you, does that mean uh, military service is just for, you know, more for us, but it's for everybody, just like you just talked. Is it that, is. And I think one it of the is. problems, I think one of the problems that you have sometimes is that uh, most people don't know much about the military at all. You know, yeah. and, I, and I tell people all the time, I mean, you learn about the military in, in I think, one of five ways, either movies, news, uh, you know, read a book, Internet, and, and by word of mouth. That's how people learn about the military. And, and sometimes they don't get the correct information. And that's why it's, it's so important to do shows like this so we can educate 
you know, our country about the kind of sacrifices our veterans and families make for this country. And Jack, yeah. and Jack, I think it's important for us to acknowledge, too, um, you know, this is one of the consequences of 9-11. I mean, we shut ourselves off. Yeah. Um, you and I, you and I remember living on installations and working on installations. Yep. There weren't ECPs. Yep. You could jump on the public bus from right around where your barracks was at a bus stop and get downtown somewhere, pick your installation. It didn't matter. Yeah. Post 9-11, we, we closed ourselves off to the communities and we became this separated thing that nobody really knew what went on inside that installation. And so, so I think over the decades, this has just grown into, well, that's something that happens over there. No, we're your army and, and you should be pretty proud of us. And oh, by the way, you could come be part of us. And, and so that's that, that's that message we're really getting after. Well, the other thing too is, is, is we don't talk much about ourselves. We don't mm -hmm. tell people our story. In fact, we just had a recruiting mm -hmm. commander our marketing, uh, enterprise marketing, army enterprise marketing on the show. And, and I told them that one of the problems we have is, is I taught, you've been taught, all my time in the service, what do we do? We keep that information to ourselves. We don't share it with anybody. Well, I guess it's to a point, it should have been a point a long time ago, that we open up and tell this country about what we do for them each and every day. And I think that's certainly a point. We just need to do more of it. It's not natural. No. You're spot on. It's not, it is... Like all the questions that you want to ask me that are about me, they're the questions I don't want to answer. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, true. that's just yeah. in, intrinsically, I don't want to talk about me. Intrinsically, yeah. I want to talk about the Army. Uh, I want to talk about the Joint Force. I want to talk about the amazing opportunities. I want to talk about how proud I am of the of our service members and their families, and in particular soldiers. And and uh, but I don't. We can't. We can't do that anymore. We we have to actually tell our story. And oh, by the way, if there's you know we say there's a million people and all their families in the army, total army. That's a million plus stories, different stories, and we got to get that out there. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've, I've been to so many places where they asked me to, to tell my stories, and, and and just like you, I, I love telling my stories because I think it's important for us to to get out there and tell the story. I, t the oath enlistment is a term that really defines a soldier's commitment to the service. And that starts with his journey and, 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 you know, much more after those words. Why is that so important to understand what that oath means and, and to carry that with them, you know, through the time they serve in the military? Yeah, I actually pulled the one, as you were doing your, uh, your opening introductions, I pulled my, my copy out um, that I carry around in my notebook. Um, and then I have one in my uh, in my in my cover that I wear in dress uniform. It's actually the one that General McConville used uh, when he when he swore me in uh, over at the old guard uh, as the 17th SMA in the Army. That one I'll I'll keep and cherish that one forever. But you know we have a tendency to take this oath at the beginning of our journey, right? Our beginning of our raising our right hand and saying, "Hey, I want to serve." Yes. There's a ton of opportunities that come with service, right? There's, 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 uh, you know, phenomenal professional opportunity. There's college education. There's healthcare. I mean, the list is long, but I, but I do like to always start with. There's the opportunity to serve your country, and I'm a little fond of this place, <laughs> uh, and 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 what it means to um, to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. So, so I'm passionate about how does Private Weimer, after he takes that oath at wherever, I mean, there's been some, some phenomenal ceremonies here uh, lately. Uh, General George was just down at the Atlanta Falcons game and, uh, geez, it was a couple, there was a couple hundred soldiers he swore in down there. They'll never forget that. <laughs> yeah. But, but I have a feeling, are they going to remember the Atlanta Falcons game or are they going to remember the oath? And, and so it's our job after, you know, Private Weimer gets through OSINT or whatever my basic and AIT journey looks like, because there's, there's different journeys. And I get to that first duty station. Who is really turning this into something tangible? Of what it meant? What did these words mean? Um, we were down at uh, um, Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina yesterday. I was down with the secretary and we were down at the recruiting uh, battalion down there. And the secretary, uh, it was awesome to see the secretary swear in two, two brand new soldiers with their families there. Small, intimate ceremony, powerful. And when it was said and done, you know, I looked at the, uh, the battalion commander down there 
And I said, hey, sir, get them a copy of that oath. Every soldier that you sign a contract with and swear it at this battalion, they should get a copy of that oath. And then as they continue their journey to that first duty assignment, there should be non-commissioned officers and officers along the way always reaffirming what that oath means. And then by the time it's Sergeant Staff Sergeant Weimer, now that oath, it's tangible. I really start to feel and sense, so does my family, what, what it meant to take that oath. And so that's, that's what I mean when I talk about, you know, the importance of the oath. And we're going to see that because it's going to be part of the Army Blue Book we're building. That oath is going to be front and center of that blue book we build for the army, just as a reminder, whether it's uh, me at 30 years taking a new oath with the chief of staff of the army as the 17th SMA, or it was private one. Yeah, you, you know, I tell people all the time, uh, you know, I, I, when I got and talked to a lot of different groups of people, and I said, you know, when somebody raised their hand and said, I will protect and defend the Constitution of the United States, I said, do you know what that means? I always ask the audience, and they always say, well, what does that mean? That means that I'm willing to die for your freedoms. Yeah, I'm yeah. willing to give my life up so you can be free. And I think that's uh, that's one of the things that a lot of people just don't realize. It's not it's not about me personally. It's about this country. It's about what's right for this country. So I'm taking an oath to uh, protect this country and do all I can to make sure we're free each and every day. And I think sometimes people take that freedom for granted and they uh, they just when don't you, realize. When you, yeah. Yeah, go you're ahead. spot on. When you raise your hand to serve something bigger than yourself. Yeah. Again, policemen. EMT, firemen, uniform service, government, there's sacrifice associated with that. That's the actual selfless part. Um, and I think we just have to remind ourselves with that oath and what that, what that means is like, hey, I'm willing to give up a little bit. I'm Not everything, right? I mean, you're not putting your life on hold, but there's just something a little different because that constitution and what that oath means is so important to the American way of life and the American people. It's so powerful. And that's where Simon Sinek talks about the why. Yeah. I'm hidden. I, I'm still trying to find a bigger why than that. Yeah. You, you know, the other thing I talk about too is it's not about today. It's about 20 years from today. Yeah. You know, a yeah. lot of people think about, hey, this is what I get to get to today. But it's not It's not just about the day. It's about, uh, you, know, so I, you know, I got uh, four uh, great grandbabies and another one on the way, great grandbabies that I got. So I have five. Wow. And yeah, so that just means I'm getting old. But uh, <laughs> but the thing about it is, is that I want their future to be free. I want them to realize that this is the best, the best country in the world. And the reason it's the best country is there is because of the kind of sacrifices our military. I mean, I want to always talk about the army, but really our military services does for you know does for all of us each and every day. So I just I, just, I, yeah. I love the oath. I, I believe in that oath. I live by it. The last thing I'll leave you with yeah. on the oath, because you know I get fired up about this. This, yeah. this is this is powerful. Um, the Russians don't have it, and the Chinese don't have it, and they and they know they need it. That and that this is part of our competitive advantage. Our people swear an oath to an idea. That constitution is an idea. That is that is so powerful. It is unique, and um, and I think that's another one of our true competitive advantages. And yes, I am all about modernization and I am a tech guy and I love experimentation and tra transformation. We should be transforming continuously. Um, but the competitive advantage is the, the man or woman that raised their hand and said, Hey, I want to swear an oath to that constitution. Well, that's, well, yeah, that, that's, that's profit. Well, the other thing I'll tell you too, is we're not the biggest army in the world. I think we're third yeah. or something like that. And the difference yeah. in our army and, and all the rest of the armies, they may have a bigger army or, or not as good equipment, that's for sure. But the, the biggest thing about our army is the equipment and the technology, but also our non-commissioned officer corps, our soldiers on the battlefield, how well they're trained there. So I think that's a, that's, that's the biggest thing. But, but we do have the best army in the world, no question about it. This is a great discussion, but there's always a but in everything I got. You know that. <laughs> we're going to take a quick break. Yeah. I will be right back. We're talking with the 17th Sergeant Major of the Army, SMA Michael R. Weimer, and you're enjoying, I hope you're enjoying this discussion. Please like us, click on that subscribe button below. Click on the bell to receive notifications of all of our upcoming video podcast releases. SMA, you, or Sergeant Major, you talked about the motivation is at the core of everything we do in the Army. I, the, you don't have to sell me, but I know about that. Can you tell us about, uh, you know, the types of motiv motivation, like intrinsic or extrinsic, and how they 
both impact the role of the character of our soldiers. I mean, I know that they do. I mean, I've been around, I've tried to motivate soldiers all my life in the military, even out of the military. So could you talk about yeah. that with us? Yeah, I will. I mean, we could talk about this for an hour. So I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to, you know, be to the point on this one. This is another one. And it'll go back to the oath. Believe me, that oath is part of the intrinsic motivation. So intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. And folks that have been around me for a while know I, I've been talking about this probably for about 15 years. And right, I've been, it's really studying what makes people tick. And that's why I do appreciate folks like Simon Sinek and in, in the study of, of human behavior. Um, uh, not that, you know, artificial intelligence doesn't have a place for us in, you know, moving forward, but human behavior is where I really anchor most of my time and figuring out what motivates people. And, I, you know, and again, to that oath, if you truly understand what that oath means and what you're saying when you repeat those words with your hand up um, and then what comes after that, intrinsically, I can't substitute that with a thing, right? Because a thing is the extrinsic piece. I can motivate you to consider service through uh, college tuition. I can motivate you through um certifications through professional licensing. I can motivate you through compensation. We do, we do all those. And by the way, those are all critically important, right? Um, but imagine if the only thing was extrinsic motivation, then there would be no oath. There would be no bigger purpose you're serving. And so I, there's a, there's a really a fine balance between um, I'm only continuing to do this. I don't even know how much money I make. Right. So I'm a really bad example of balancing the two. Yeah. My wife knows, by the way, there's no question that. about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But there's a, there's a balance between, you know, SMA Weimer, how, what keeps you going every morning to want to continue to serve in this capacity? It's not extrinsic motivations. There's no financial piece. There's no more college. There's no more 401k. It is all intrinsic at this point, right? To serve the soldiers and their families. I call it legacy work. That's intrinsic motivation, right? But there's a balance. You're going to have a family along the way, most likely. Um, you got to be a parent in some form. You're going to be a good spouse. That requires stability. That requires, you know, financial compensation. So that, you know, job opportunity, spouse employment, we move people around a lot, right? Those are all the extrinsic things to continue to balance the intrinsic motivation that you said, I want to serve the constitution and this flag and the bigger purpose and what it means. And, and you really said it well, by the way, I'm plowing and planting for the people that come behind me, right? Because a lot of the service that I've done over the years, I won't actually see in the human space, the benefit of investing in all those people until probably I'm out of uniform. And oh, by the way, that's a good thing. And so, so again, intrinsic motivation to me is very important. Uh, you know, Cynic talks about, you know, people need to understand the why. What's the purpose? Do they feel valued? All those things really matter, but they're squishy. And so sometimes the squishy stuff, the stuff that's hard to feel and measure, we, we put a little less value on it. I can measure bonuses. I can measure special duty pay. I can measure advanced incentive pay. I can measure... The list goes on and on. So we have a tendency to anchor there. Those are all incredibly important. But I also like to remind us the intrinsic motivation to serve something bigger than yourself. Yeah. You know, when I, when I came into the Army, uh, I spent a three years, a three years, 30 days, in fact, and then got out, stayed out two years. And when I came back in, uh, when I got out, uh, something had changed inside of me, uh, something that, that made me— uh, the person I am today, and and I just every every day of my life when I was out, I missed it, and I wanted to go back. And you add all those other things. I mean, one of the key things though is how can leaders help shape, grow, and guide, and motivate the you know the new young soldiers. That's really a key. It's you have to be a special person to motivate soldiers, and you got as a leader, and you got to figure out what ticks. How do you make them tick, and how do you get them to have yeah. trust and confidence in you? So, would you talk about that with us? How can leaders yeah, do that? So that's a, that's a good one. Um, oh boy, where to start, man, you get me excited about that one, right? How do you motivate people to see value in themselves? How do you motivate people to, uh, 
to take a little risk, right? The, what fear is usually the one thing, the common thread from everybody that keeps them from actually trying. You know, all the opportunities we talk about, why do the majority of people not take advantage of three quarters of the opportunities uh, the United States military offers them is usually fear of failure. And so how, how as a leader, do you motivate people to go, hey, I want to give that a try. I always tell everybody the Army's uh, like a, um, a long hallway. For those of us that remember the Matrix, there was those long hallways full yeah. of doors. Yeah. Every one of those doors in that hallway, endless hallway, every one of those doors is an opportunity. But you have to go to the door, open it, and step in and apply yourself. And then the army immediately provides you another opportunity, even if you fail when you open that door. Because, by the way, we are all about coach, teach, develop, learn. Failure is not a sign of weakness, right? We're, that's our culture, right? That leading through that's mm -hmm. a big deal, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, but I always tell everybody, um, one, you got to model it. Because if you're audio and video, if everything I'm saying, I'm not modeling in some way, I have no credibility. I have no authenticity as a leader, right? And so your reputation and credibility is based off your reputation and, and how you live your life, not what you talk about, right? And so, so when leaders, it's why young squad leaders, we say the squad leaders on the front line of truly uh, coaching, I would argue platoon sergeant and the first sergeant, first sergeant being the hardest gray plate in the United States Army right now, it probably has been for a long time. Yeah. You probably agree with me on that, but yeah. I would say in this day and age, it's highlighted. The model behavior of those leaders that I just rattled off quickly, and this audience knows what all of them do and the responsibility associated. Man, if you're not modeling what right looks like, what we're talking about here, how many of those soldiers are going to actually heed anything you recommend or you coach them on? Zero. Because you're not, you're not authentic. And so audio and video matching. And so when you share, back to your share your experience, hey, I shared some things I failed at. Let's talk about pre-scuba that didn't work out. I obviously wasn't meant to be, uh, you know, on a, on a, a, a dive, a dive qualified operator on a, on a dive team. Yeah. I sure gave it a try two times and it didn't work out. <laughs> um, and so again, but I had people that encouraged me to step out. And give it a shot. And if you fail, oh, by the way, it's okay. You'll learn from it. And then another opportunity presented itself. And, you know, look where I'm sitting with you. So, so again, really, really modeled behavior is to me something we don't, uh, we don't talk about enough. We talk a lot about PME, right? And, and I call it the caring equation, right? And uh, my, my PAO, Master Arm Wallace, likes when I talk about this. So I will bring it up, right? I can give you all the PME in the world. You can read all the Jim Collins and, and Simon Sinek books in the world, right? And I take the sum of those uh, events over your career. And then I'm going to add that to the model behavior, the model behavior that I've witnessed. I've worked for some great leaders and I've worked for some not so great leaders. I think you would agree with me over your time. I've been there. <laughs> That's for yep, sure. Yeah. Right. But you learn from both of them, absolutely. Which we don't we don't like to acknowledge every uh, too often. But you take the sum of those two parts, you you kind of want to jump already to the sum of Mike Weimer as a leader. Yeah. But there's one piece that we're missing in that equation, and that's this piece you got to multiply those two sums by. Yeah. And that's do I actually care about developing soldiers and developing leaders? If I don't actually care. I don't care how big that sum is of those two things, how many books I've read, how much PME I've gone to. If this, if my caring level is zero, the sum is zero. I'm not very good at math, but I'm here to tell you, no matter what you multiply times zero is going to be zero on the other hand. If I actually understand what we teach in our professional military education, that caring matters and I need to demonstrate that. So it's at least a one. At least the sum of those two things equals something. And I've worked for that leader, too, that's like super uh, introverted and struggles to connect with people. But you can see they're really trying because they know it matters. But imagine if you actually care. General McConville used to talk about the four C's. Right? He used to talk about commitment. He used to talk about character. He used to talk about competence. And that fourth one was caring. 
Yeah. But imagine when you think about when you worked for a leader that really cared and they were a two or a three. I take the sum of those those PMEs and self-study and model behavior and I multiply it times a two or a three. The sum on the other end is just doubled, tripled. And that's how I think you reproduce awesome leaders, right? And so when we talk talent management, I give people a big factor that care. Um, Do you actually care about people as much as you care about the mission? Winning does matter, but I actually need to have my team with me when I get to the finish line. Because we fight as a team, we win as a team, we lose as a team. And so that's kind of the caring equation that I talk about. And frankly, I didn't have anybody kind of break that down until I was probably a master sergeant because I was pretty selfish. It was all about me. It was all about uh, the mission. And um, and whoever couldn't keep up, we replaced. And, and I'm not proud of that. I, I'm not proud of that. But then I worked for a leader that really modeled this. And I realized I didn't have to lead like I was leading. It changed my entire perspective. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny you say that because I, I, too, have worked for people that uh, I didn't necessarily like and I didn't like their leadership and, and the way they treated people. But I, but I did learn from that. I just want to add, I just want to add a couple of things that you said. First of all, they got to trust you. They got to believe in you. They got to believe that you're, you care about it. The other thing I'll tell you, there's a lot to be said about leading by example. You got to be a good communicator and a good listener. And then the last thing I'll say, because everything that you said, I agree 100%. The last thing, uh, you have to train the way you're going to fight. And there's just no second best in our profession. And uh, I yeah. think that, that you just got, it's the basic fundamentals that really prepare you to do what you got to do on the battlefield. You know, you can talk about all this, all this big stuff all the time, but but it's a basic stuff. Can you shoot your weapon? Do you know your? I'm just a little stuff yeah. that means so much that, uh, that you know that uh, soldiers think about. Leaders need to think. And then the last thing I'll say is, is and you said it already, probably better than I could say it anyway. It's the individual squad leader, team leader that makes the difference uh, in a yes. fight. And, and again, and, yeah, yeah. You got to be brilliant at the basics. And everybody hears me say that, and they always want me to define it and. And like, if you don't know what the basics are yeah. for your duties and responsibilities, yeah. then you're probably not modeling what right looks like already, which is, so that's a good place to start. Find a whiteboard, get on it with your counterpart, whoever that is. If it's, you know, a platoon sergeant, your PL, your company commander, you need to write down and you need to agree. These are the basics. We are absolutely responsible. No fail. We will be good at these things. Because if you're not, then you're never going to handle the complex. The complex is going to eat your lunch. And when we compromise and sacrifice on that list of the basics, we're compromising on our readiness and we're compromising on why we exist. We exist to fight and win. And so that's why I'm, I'm pretty ruthless on the basics, right? Um, we can win silver and bronze medals in training. There is no silver medal and bronze medal in combat. No, absolutely not. And so training hard failing, getting better at those basics, always holding yourself to that standard, that's good training management because second place in combat is living with regret. Yeah, there is no second base. I, I want to say something. I want to dive into another question. I, when I was a division sergeant major, <clears throat> when I got to be the division sergeant major, they was qualifying with their weapons <clears throat> without wearing uh, body armor. And so I got there and I said, I'll put your body armor. That's the way you got to shoot. And everybody complained because the scores was going down. And as soon as I got there, I says, how are we going to go to war? Are you going to take your body armor and fight off? You know, I, you're not going to do that. Uh, so you got to train the way you're going to fight. I want to dive into known as caring equation. Uh, what is that and why is it so important? Well, I, I, would, I would argue, I'll use myself as an example because I think it's, you know, I, well, first, there's just goodness in that. You're going to model humility. You better, you better be make light of yourself first. Um, I, I, I'll tell you, the Mike Weimer that's sitting here having this conversation with you, Jack, is not the Mike Weimer when I was an E6, E7, and in even part of when I was an E8. Well, you're older um, now. You're older were, now, more experienced too. Yeah. Well, yeah. besides besides the fake joints and and, <laughs> and full, of, yeah. full of metal and gray no, I got hair. That. Um, uh, you know, I'm a product 
of people investing in me yeah. over my journey. And, and we, we need to acknowledge that. I know, I know you believe that. Absolutely. We've talked about this. Yep. I, I, am a pro, I am a product of sweat, laughter, tears, frustration, tough counseling. Oh, by the way, some of it written and I deserved it. Um, I mean, but that was people that cared enough about me. They saw something in me along the way, that young, cocky, know-it-all. They saw something in me. And so they cared enough to, as my grandfather would have said, you know, jerk a knot in my rear end yeah. when I needed it, but also set me down and have a hard conversation about when I was making a personal selfish decision that was not benefiting the team. Um, or potentially putting myself in, 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 uh, in a, in a bad predicament, um, you know, professionally and personally, right. Cause that personal and professional, they bleed, they bleed together. And we're seeing that in this day and age in, in 2023, like never before, just with the information space. Right. Um, and so I would tell you the leaders that cared about me the most have had the most impact on me. Yeah. The leaders that didn't care. Yeah. All they did was show me an example of how not to lead. Yeah. So they had an impact. I'll give them a, a half a point, but they didn't have the big impact. Yeah. And I could, you know, it wouldn't be right for me to list it, but I'm telling you in private, if you, if you haven't done this in private to reflect on this, write those names down because in the people business, that, that's real people. Like if you're a Sergeant major in the United States army, there's no way you can't write names down and faces pop into your head. That people that cared about you along the way. Uh, many of them are officers and many of them are non-commissioned officers. Uh, you know, and also, by the way, some of them are retirees that were senior when I was junior who continued to check on me when they retired as I continued to, to develop in the Army. Real relationships, real caring. That's, the, that's where I've kind of – the caring equation has been something I've been working on since about 2010 – I didn't call it that in the beginning. I didn't even know what to call it. To be honest with you, I'm not even sure I like the term caring equation, but I had to like call it something um, because I do believe it is the X factor that matters in developing leaders. Yeah, I, I think I think a year before you was ever selected, I think we met at uh, AUSA. And when you sit down, I wouldn't sit down. We stood there and talked for about five minutes, I think it was. And I'm going to take a quick break, but I want to tell you this before I do that. But uh, I told you, I said, don't change who you are because the things that you got growing up through you the did. military, don't change who you are. And the other thing I told you, I think I told you, was 50% of the people like you and 50% of the people won't like you. So when you make a decision, yeah. you make a decision that's yeah. based not necessarily for you, but based for the United States Army. And I think that's uh, yeah. that's that's really what you got to live by. And and I, and I know that you live by live by that every day, and I try to live by that. We got to take a quick break, a commercial break like everything else. And when I come back, we got a lot more to talk about. You're watching your next mission, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. You're watching your next mission video podcast, proudly presented by Navy Federal Credit Union, the most trusted credit union owned by members of the military community, serving all branches of the armed forces and their families. Their members are the mission. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Purdue Global. You're ready for a comeback, and with Purdue Global, you can do more than take classes. You can take charge of your story, of your career, of your life. Earn a degree you can be proud of and get an education employer's respect. Start your comeback at purdueglobal.edu. USAA. Oh. A promise is a trust not to be broken. Right, Whether spoken with an oath or sealed with a pinky. And after 100 years, we're still taking care of the military community and their families. That's our mission, always. Now back to your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army, Jack L. Tilly. Welcome back. We're blessed to be here today with the 17th Sergeant Major of the Army, SMA Michael R. Weimer. Remember, this is, uh, this is your show. Tell us about your transition. Tell us what topics you like to cover on the show. We want to do whatever you want to do or whatever you want to talk about. We, we want to hear from you guys. You can call or text me at 844-424-1134 or send me an email at smatilly at yournextmission.org. And guess what? I'll actually reach back out to you. Sergeant Major, our world is in a crazy place right now. And I think uh, 
we as a nation are more susceptible to any kind of attack uh, than ever before in history. Uh, why is it so important for soldiers to be at the peak of their performance and and how does the Army, and how's, really, how is the Army addressing that overreaching need? Yeah, it is. You know, we probably say, you know, we're, we're, at, a, we're at a, you know, a defining moment in history. We're at a, you know, it's a crucible Western democracy. I mean, we say that a lot. I've heard that a lot in the last 20 years. Um, but it is unique right now. There's some, there's some unique things going on that uh, haven't been uh, the uh, factors associated with saying that over the last 20 years, right? Um, I mean, we have, uh, we have near peer adversaries right now that uh, we, need to, uh, we need to do everything we can in our power to where we always continue to say near yeah, and never remove that term near. Um, I, I, take, uh, I take personal interest and I feel professionally obligated um, to really to really make sure that that near stays in that term forever. Um, America needs us to do that. But, but I have to peel the onion back on like, okay, we have the least amount of certainty. We have, uh, we have interesting domestic stuff in America, right? It's part of, it's part of, uh, it's part of being a country, right? This is all part of the growing pains sure. of being a country. Uh, we're still a fairly young country when you look at it in the grand scheme of, of countries. Right. And so, I have confidence we'll figure all that out, but it but it's real. You know where we are with um, with budgets and current situation, where we are with you know predictable funding for the Department of Defense, et cetera, et cetera. That's all real stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, things that you've experienced in your time sitting here in the building, but then some pretty unprecedented. Uh, yeah, uh, some would say even a new normal, which is not which is not good uh, in our line of work. Right. So you take all that and then you take what we have going on with um, People's Republic of China. You have what's going on in uh, Ukraine. And then, of course, frame it with um, the uh, unforeseen issues with Hamas and Israel uh, and the uh, in the tragedy that is right now what's happening in Gaza and Israel and tensions uh, rising in the Middle East uh, because of that. Um, what do we do with that? What do you do with that as a non-commissioned officer? Right. Like you have to. You have to take all that energy and all that concern and hopefully not angst because that's not helpful to anybody. What do you do with that? I would encourage us to pour that into what it means to be ready. Because if the nation calls us to respond to anything under the sun that, you know, and I only articulated a few of the things going on in the world, um, we have to really be ready. So what does that mean to you? If you and I were in, you know, 3rd Brigade, 82nd Airborne, what does that mean if we were in a company together? What does that mean if I'm in 10th Mountain? What does that mean in 4th Infantry Division, 2nd Infantry Division on Penn Peninsula um, in Korea right now with 8th Army? What does that mean? So as a leader, I got to turn that into something. And it begins with my personal responsibility as a soldier to be ready. Am I fit? Yeah. Am I fit mentally, physically, spiritually, um, the holistic health and fitness and what we have going on with H2F and changing the culture of fitness and what it means to be healthy and resilient in the army. We're in a place we've never been before. It's I'm, I'm, I'm so proud of the army and I come from this, from the soft background and have had the luxury of, of starting this journey within special operations command much earlier than the army but I'm so proud of where the army is now because we transferred so much of that over in the army. And so how am I leveraging that for my personal fitness? Where's my level of personal discipline in that? Um, I, Mike Weimer, specialist, Sergeant SMA, I'm still responsible for me. Am I a good teammate? Do I even know my teammates? Who's in my squad? This is my squad is a real thing. Yeah. Do I know them? Do I care about them? Do I know how they are with their families? What, what's going on? That's real. Um, do I know the basics? And am I any good at the basics? Back to being, are you brilliant at the basics and what you're responsible for? Mm -hmm. Those are all things that I can manage at my own level when I come, when I come into this big statement about readiness. But then becomes the non-commissioned officer who says, is my team, squad, platoon, company ready? And, and I would argue 
when we when we do that at echelon and we worry less about two echelons above me, I think we're actually getting at what it means to be ready. Because if you think about everybody doing that at the echelon where they are collectively now, we're way more ready than we actually think we could be. It's hard to get a CTC rotation, whether you're at uh, you're you're out out west or whether you're at Fort Johnson. Um, JRTC or NTC, right? Those are hard. What am I doing in between the awesome op- uh, opportunities to get in the box, to get in the dirt, as Forcecom would say? Let's get in the dirt and let's test ourselves. All that work down to Mike Weimer's responsibility as a personal, disciplined soldier, that all matters. And so then you take all that angst that is the news cycle and everything that's going on in the globe. And then you actually give yourself something you can take that and put it into. That's, that's where I'm trying to focus. And I think non-commissioned officer corps is responsible for that. And we have the soldiers at echelon that can take the ownership of that. And, and Oh, by the way, be ready. And you're, and we're probably got to be ready for something we don't even know about. How do you prepare to be ready for something you can't predict? Be brilliant at the basics. Yeah. You, you know, you, whatever you think is going to happen never happens. Uh, I mean, whatever you think is going to happen never happens. I, I'd say just a couple of things real quick. And you said it already. I'll say it a little bit differently. Uh, stay in your lane of responsibility. And you said it just a minute ago. Don't worry about what's going on to your left or right and all the rest of the stuff. Just stay in your lane and and make sure that you're ready to do exactly uh, what, you, what you have to do. Hey, this has been a great discussion. I know that I appreciate you jumping on us today or jumping on the show and talking to us. And I just, I just really appreciate what you do. And, and you're right. I know what it's like to work in the Pentagon. I went through the same stuff. I was there for 9-11, and it's, uh, it's tough times. No different. It's always going to be tough in that job. And, but I appreciate what you're doing because you're doing a wonderful job. But just keep uh, telling the veteran community about what's going on. Keep us informed about how we can help our Army. Just because I took the uniform doesn't mean it's not my Army uh, anymore. Any final thoughts, anything that you want to share with the audience or anything that uh, – you don't want to tell the, the people that are listening about, uh, you know, maybe your concerns or whatever you want to say. Yeah. I, you know, I thought about this a little bit and I, you know, I think I'll sum it up with this, Jack. I, I really like, there's a lot going on. Um, and we're a big army, a million people plus their families is a massive, that's a massive army. It is truly what an institution looks like, right? That kind of large, uh, large, uh, organization, Um, and you know, I've only been in the Pentagon since two May now in the seat since four August. And I would tell you what I want America to know, what I want our soldiers to know, what I want Congress to know, what I want the world to know is one, we are focused on war fighting and people do matter. You can't be a phenomenal war fighter. If you can't be a good teammate, you can't be a phenomenal war fighter. If you're not taking care of your family. You can't, you see where I'm going yeah, with this, yeah. right? It all matters. Yeah. And I want folks to trust, like really trust that, you know, the things we talked about today, they're the intrinsic things that motivate us, right? Um, yes, it's sometimes hard to measure, but I mean, we care to a point. We're not perfect. A million person organization with their families is never going to be perfect. But we care to the point to where everything that we're trying to get after to be the ultimate warfighters on the planet, really, because remember, the goal is to be so good and so scary, you never go to large scale combat. That's deterrence, right? But you're ready if you're called, right? The whole pray for peace, but you're always ready to go to war. That's real readiness. Um, I want I want everybody to trust us that that's real. We're passionate about it. And again, we're getting after that. Um, I know it's not always, uh, it's not always perfect and it can be a little messy, but that's, that's really what I want people to know. And I will tell you, being the newest guy in this building, um, I'm seeing that. I see that from the government civilians. I see it from the, you know, the field grade officers that are rowing hard and working crazy hours here. Uh, I see it from my team, the chief's team, the secretary's team. Uh, and I, sometimes I just don't think that gets, uh, really any acknowledgement. Um, um, and again, not normal times, 
but we're getting after it. And I think people need to have that trust, the trust of the institution. We talk a lot about that. I was down at Duke yesterday and we were talking about, you know, are we losing trust to the institutions? Well, there's data showing that institutions are losing trust. But I want America, I want service members, I want everybody to not lose trust in the Army and the Department of Defense. Yeah. I think that is a that is a key component to who we are when I go back to where I started this oath. There you go. Well, God bless you. Well, a couple of things. First of all, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate all you do and all you continue to do. And uh, I want to, this year, I'm going to put it out there to you right now. Make sure we celebrate the Army's birthday together. You and the Chief, jump out if we can do that. Love to have you come on the show and talk about We're working it. We're working talk it. Talk about our Army. That's for sure. And then the last thing I can tell you, this four years is going to go fast. So just remember, at the end of these four years, you got to carry my suitcase. I don't know if you know that or not, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember. I, it, that's that's SMA Grinson's job right now. No, that's right. That's great. You got it next. <laughs> God bless you. Thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate you, Jack. I really do. And uh, appreciate all our veterans out there. Uh, thanks for telling your story and advocating for your Army. Hoo -ah! God bless you. <laughs> thanks again to the 17th Sergeant Major of the Army, SMA Michael A. Weimer, for, for being a guest on the show today. I'm Jack Tilly, 12th Sergeant Major of the Army, and you've been watching your next mission video podcast, and thank you for joining us. Log on to our website at yournextmission.org and leave me a review. I hope it's a good review, but if it's a bad one, I guess I can take that. I always say that, too. While you're there, though, you can visit our nonprofit and corporate partners who, who have jobs and services that are available that can assist you in your transition from the military. And we just added a new job board for partnership with the Recruit Military where you can search a, a job that's a perfect fit for you. Check out our video on our website to learn how to fine tune your search. You can also create your own individual profile. Scan the QR code on the screen or on the website to create your profile. All information is collected is confidential and won't be shared with anybody. Please know we, all of us, wanna help you any way we can. You can follow me on all my personal social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Rumble. And if you liked what we're doing with your next mission, click on that subscribe button below. Don't forget to click on the bell to receive notifications about all of our upcoming video podcasts. Don't forget, we want to hear from you. Please leave me a message or or send me a text at 844-424-1134 or send me an email at smatilly at yournextmission.org. Thanks again to Sergeant Major Weimer. It was just great having him on the show. And I always like to leave people with final thoughts, but uh, today, uh, just like every day, but today we had the senior non-commissioned officer for the United States Army come on the show and, and talk about his concerns, his focus, his direction, and the things that's going to make our Army better and better and better every day. You see, uh, there is no second best in our profession. It's about this country. It's about what we do to protect this country each and every day. So for the non-commissioned officers and, and family members and soldiers and whoever's less than a day, remember, this is our country. We got to fight for our country. But most of all, we just got to make sure that we're ready to defend our country. Again, thanks for watching. Thanks to New Mind Students. And of course, our presented sponsor, Blue Cross Blue Shield, FEP Dental and FEP Vision. Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue Global, and USA. We appreciate all you do for our military. You've been listening and as to always, your next mission, see you on the high ground. The American Freedom Foundation. Learn more by visiting yournextmission.org.